the martial art movie today, they don't emphasize the, the good side. They don't emphasize the inside. All they emphasize is killing, violence. What's going on, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlecake Martial Arts Radio, episode 560, with today's guest, Dr. Jwin Min Yang. I'm your host, Jeremy Lesniak. I'm the founder of Whistlekick, and I'm a passionate traditional martial artist. I love martial arts probably about as much, maybe a little bit more than you. And that's why you're here, because we talk about martial arts. In fact, Whistlekick does a lot for the martial arts community. If you want to check out everything that we're doing, go to whistlekick.com, look at all the projects that we're involved in, all the products. We're constantly looking at how to bring you more, how to improve what we're doing. And really, isn't that the hallmark of a martial artist? How do we make things better a little bit at a time? Well, over at whistlekick.com, one of the things you're going to find is our store. It's one of the ways we fund all this stuff that we do. And if you find something in there that you like, use the code PODCAST15, saves you 15%, helps us know that the podcast leads to sales. Everybody wins. If you want to check out the website for the show, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. It's a whole separate website. We bring you two episodes every week, and the goal of the show is to connect and educate and entertain traditional martial artists around the world. If you want to show your appreciation for what we do, like I said, you could make a purchase, but you could also share an episode. You could follow us on social media, spread the word about what we're doing, you know, share a post somewhere or tell a friend, pick up one of our books, leave a review, or support our Patreon. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick. It's a place where we post exclusive content. And if you contribute as little as $2 a month, you get access to it. Let's talk about the show. Today's guest has done a lot. Now, I know people say that. Oh, this person's done a lot. No, this person has done a lot. Dr. Yang has written books and founded a publishing house and taught directly or indirectly. I can't even fathom the number of people. He is well regarded, well respected. And even if you aren't familiar with his name, there's a very good chance that you are familiar with his work. On today's episode, we talk about his books, and we talk about movies, we talk about philosophy, we talk about Star Wars. It's a great conversation that I think all martial artists need to hear. And I don't know that I say that very often. I don't know that I've said it at all, but it's definitely true of today's episode. So here we go. Dr. Yang, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you. <laughs> Happy to Happy be to here. Being yeah, here. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I appreciate you being here. And, you know, let's, let's start. Let's, let's jump right into it. And I always ask, almost always ask the guests, pretty much the same old, I mean, you could call it a boring question, but I think it's an important question. We're, we're on a martial arts show. We're martial artists. We're going to talk about martial arts. We've got to know how you got there. So when did you start training? Well, uh, I tell you what, I was born in 1946. It ended up now I'm 74 years old now. So when I started, I was uh, 15 years old. But, you know, at that time between Taiwan and the communist China, at that time still in the wartime. So everybody prepared for the war. So I remember when I was 15, 16, we are learning how to use the M1 rifle already. Not only men, the women too. So they have to learn how to fight. So when there's a war, they will be drafted. When you draft it, you die. So that's why that's the time we grew up at that time is the war time. So because the war time, so that's why everybody psychology wise is now peaceful because everybody say, okay, why should I go to school? You know, you go to school, you, you're going to die in the battle anyway. So because you, you, you be conditioned, your mind has been brainwashed to fight for the war. Okay, so under that kind of situation, a lot of people have a different concept. Say, okay, what they want to do, some has become, say, okay, I, they want to show they are brave enough. And some people just, uh, they are a little bit cowardly. So they go to they become gangsters. So that kind of chaos. So when I started 15 years old, at that time, I find a master, the white crane master in the mountains. So, and from my friend's introduction, I went there to learn white crane from this master. So I learned with him for 13 years until I came to the United States in 1974. I came to the United States for Purdue University to, to get my PhD. So at that time, I stayed with him for 13 years. Then. When I was uh, 16 years old, because uh, 
from I was nine years old to 15 years old, Actually, nine years old to 12 years old at that time, there's not too much food in Taiwan because everything is prepared for the war. So especially in my family, we have nine children. I was the number two. So most of the time, you're starving. So end up, a lot of my brother and sister, and includes me, and they developed the ulcer. So that ulcer never disappeared never disappear from I was nine years old until 15. So one day my white claim master asked me, because uh, when I was training, I was a cold sweat and my stomach pain. And then I sit in the corner and uh, he come take a look and then he, he, he checked my pulse. And then he said, well, you have some problem internally. I say, yes, because this pain since I was nine years old until now, it never go away. And the uh, doctor says, so also. So, <clears throat> He said, I heard you practice Tai Chi Chan will help you to relax internal organ for healing. Because at that time, see, that time the 1960s, that time is conservative. So once you learn from one master, you cannot learn from the other master. It's considered betrayal. So because he said that, let me he approve. He suggests I can learn Tai Chi Chan from the other master. So because the reason when I was 16 years old, I started searching for the Tai Chi master. Hopefully I can heal my ulcer. So I found out there's a, there's a, a teacher is a, he's teaching English and also teach the soccer game in the good high school because I was in the gangster high school. So <laughs> when one morning I went there and to see him, I asked him if he can take me as soon. At that time, there are five students. He had already with the, the, the good students from that good school and only one from the gangster high school. You see, amazing part is that after I learned from him for six months, the first thing I learned is uh, deep breathing, how to move the lower back and the spine, and then learn to relax internal organs. See, after six months, amazing part is uh, the episode of, of the ulcer, it start reduced. And after one year, and they very seldom come back again. So that means I, I start practice Tai Chi Chuan. A lot of people ask me, say, why you are so young? You're 16 years old. You start learning Tai Chi Chuan. It's not because I like it. I hate it. <laughs> because it's a, <laughs> it's a very, very slow motions. And then, you know, but question, I learned to be calm and uh, to, to know how to move the body so I can move my internal organ and relaxly and softly. And uh, with the deep breathing, the amazing part, that's what helped my internal organs start relax and repair itself. So I practiced with uh, Master Gao for Tai Chi Chuan for two and a half years. Then I went to Taipei already. I went to Taipei for my college, for my universities. So from there, I, in my classroom, in my same class, I found out there's a, another of my classmates. It's called Nielsen Zhou. He, he learned long fist. Long fist, you know, in China, long fist is special for long range fighting. It's come from northern style, northern China. And I learned white crane is the southern style. Is a, because, you know, in China, you see the Great War, on the north of the Great War is a dry land. A dry land, that's a people, they ride a horse and they use a leg for kicking for martial arts. But when you go to the Yangtze River south, it's uh, because the uh, Himalaya, there's two biggest rivers from China. It's the Yellow River and the, uh, and also uh, Yellow River and Yangtze River. So those people from Himalaya, so that's the two biggest rivers coming down. So oh, that's why they develop a lot of small rivers and a lot of lake. So that's why the southern Chinese martial arts style, they had to have a good route and uh, most of short range fighting because uh, very often you fight on the boat. So because reason Sun Star emphasize the routine is don't use the leg as much, but at the same time the hand is good and like to stick with you. And at the same time they emphasize short range fighting. So because the reason my classmate he learned long fist is long range. So first thing we met each other, he said, he knows I learned white crane, I know he learned long fist. First thing he said, hey, that's fine, that's fine. Then we just go to classroom, push all the chair away, and then and then we fight. And after five few times, I realized, gosh, his leg is fast. Because I, from the long range, I got big problem. But when I get close into short range, then he got problem. So after that, I say, well, can you teach me how to kick? He said, why do you want me to teach you kick? 
I have to long fist. He said, can get my master here. That's why we get a master Lee from Taipei to Tamkong College at that time. And we found a club. And that's why we start, I started learning long fist. So that's why in my lifetime, I've had three masters. Uh, White Crane is the longest one, and the Tai Chi is the shortest one. It's two and a half years, and the long fist about eight years, until when I was 27 years old, I came to the United States in 1974. Okay, <laughs> that's how I got started. And I started at that time because to me, it's a, psychologically, you're preparing for the war. So you have to think, you keep thinking about, would I be brave enough to accept the challenge when I go to the war? Would I be able to handle the situation without uh, with conference? See, that's all I'm looking for. But at the same time, you know, I will never go back to ask my my father and uh, if I can learn martial arts, because a lot of time a lot of kids learn martial arts to fight, become gangsters. It just surprised me. My my father said, Oh, no problem. I said, What? Because uh, I was expect he's going to against it. Then later, my grandma told me because the Young's family, the Young's family, we we live next to the military airport. But when Japanese controlled Taiwan at the time, and then later, four years after the war, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Then American joined the war. When American joined the war, the Americans start attack Taiwan, especially the military base. That's the airport, military airport and the Young's village next to the airport. And that's the end of the big problem because the Japanese, they hide a cannon in the village and to shoot American airplanes. So because the reason America had to bomb the village. So that's why end up the village people after the war, about 40% got killed because of the war. And the young people, they moved to the city. So my father moved to the city because of the sadness of what happened there. <laughs> and my grandma told me, at that time, before the war, actually, Young's village, there are about seven to 800 people. All last names Young. So inside, they, every, about 70, 80% trained martial arts, includes women. So because it's a, it's a family style. I didn't know that until my grandma told me. That's my father never against me. My father said, oh, okay, go ahead to learn. So that's how I get started. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It- There's so much there that we can talk about. I'm not quite sure where to start. I I think I want to start with the with the Tai Chi. That Uh, White Crane probably the one influenced me most. Yeah, because uh, sure. My my but but, (laughs) go ahead. Yeah, my my White Crane master. He's a farmer. Okay, he's not educated. He couldn't read. He couldn't write. He's just very purely farmer. When he was uh, when he was uh, 16 years old, because he had family styles. But Christian, he couldn't allow to learn family style because when he was a child, he was given away to another family of his grandmom's family to carry the last name. But in China, this common when you have so many kids, you just give some away and to carry the name for the other family. So because of the reason he was not allowed to learn family style, and end up when he was 16 years old, he discovered Jin, Jin Sao Feng, that's a master Jin, He's a teacher. He's from mainland China in the mountain. So he asked, he went there and uh, asked to, to be accepted as uh, the, the uh, students. So he was accepted. So he was there when he was 16 years old. He stayed with Master Jin for 23 years until Master Jin passed away. Because at that time, they have a nine, nine students total. Because nine students total at that time in Chinese martial arts, you know, family, this is a lot of, a lot of students. Usually they take only two or three. So he was the number nine. He was the youngest one. So he stayed with him for 23 years until Master Jin passed away. Then four of them, they stay in the tomb and protect the tomb for three years because they are afraid that anymore or some people come to dig the tomb or they destroy the tomb. After three years, they secure the tomb, then they separate. So, so 23 years he learned from Master Jin. So when he get out, he was in the 40s. So and that's why I started learning from him. When I started learning from him, I was the 19th. Actually, in my group is the 19. I was the number 19. I was the youngest one. <laughs> so <laughs> it's amazing part. See, he changed my life because before I was 15, I was uh, I like to fight. I was a uh, violent because. Uh, and I was not happy about my life. All the starvations, all the get ready for the war, and so many kids in the family. 
and uh, it's, it's not peaceful. My mind is not peaceful. But once I started learning from my white crane master, I found out he's different. He's a farmer. He's very peaceful. Everything was in nature. He grow chicken, grow pig, and uh, farm it. And the amazing part is uh, the philosophy he understands about life is so deep. Okay, just give us some of the stories I learned from this guy because I was with him 13 years. Actually, he's more closer to me than my father, tell the truth. Mm. Because uh, not, I can talk to him, no problem. And he can give me nice advice. My father, because I'm the Japanese mentality, when I ask him question, he just slap your face. He says, just not ask question. Those kind of mentality. Yeah, that's uh, in Japanese time, your father is authorities. <laughs> See, but my white grand master is not the same thing. See, so one, for example, there's a few stories here I want to share with you because those are stories. Please. This story is the one continue to affect my life until today. And the amazing, this stuff from 16 years old, 15 years old, all these stories stuck into my mind, always keep remind me about what a person I am supposed to be. See, because my, my master say, what can my master say? He say, you look one thing, your learning martial art is not learning martial arts. I said, what? He said, no. Learning martial art is the way to learn the meaning of life, to understand the meaning of life. So you have to challenge yourself and you have to suffer. From the suffer, you have to fall. You know how to stand up stronger. See, that, that's the mentality is different because it's not the same. So when I listen to that, I say, yes, I have to accept the challenge. Okay. So then the, at that time, everything I learned is uh, from surface. It's not deep. But question, he one day he talked to all of us. He said, look, all you look at, you see is appearance. It's all the forms. And they don't know what is the meaning behind the forms and how it created. Because that's important. You don't know how they created that you don't know the meaning of the moments. Then that means not only the feeling is shallow, you cannot even use it in the fight, in the, in the defense. Okay, then he tells us the story. He said, there's a boy. He said, this boy comes to see a master. He said, hey, master, I heard you can change a piece of rock into gold. Is that true? The master said, yeah, it's true. You want a piece of gold? I change one for you. But boy said, no, no, no. I don't want the gold. I want the trick. My master, if you know the trick, you can create. If you don't know the trick, all you do is just gold. You just, or get, just go up, you spend it, you got nothing. So because this reason, that's what like it's inspired me to say, wow, that means I want to learn every moment. I want to see, trace back to what is the reason of that moment and what the defense offensive purpose. And in this case, I will know from there, I will be able to create new things. See? So that's the one thing that those kind of talking for him, he was not educated. But he can understand this one through 23 years with his master by learning martial arts. Okay, <clears throat> one day, one day I was after one year, I was so proud of myself because I believe after one year, I can do better than another of my classmates. He was there for three years. Then one afternoon I went to see him because uh, after the school, I got nothing to do. I went to see him and uh, he was there free. So I went there to talk to him. And I was mentioned about, mentioned about, oh, I think I'm better than that guy. What do you think? <laughs> I was hoping he'd give me some of a, a praise, say, say, oh, you did a good job or something like that. No, he didn't. He looked at me and he said, hey, little young. Because when I was 16 years old, I didn't grow up yet. I still very short. He said, hey, little young, you see the bamboo? Because bamboo in China, in Taiwan, is everywhere. So you see the bamboo? I say, yeah. He said, you see, the taller they grow, the lower they bow. So that means the more you learn, the more you, you have, then the lower you should bow. That means you should be more humble. Oh, that hit me so hard. That made me a very amazing, important person for my life because that sentence always keep in my mind. When I accomplish something, I should not proud of myself. What I do, I keep my head bowed down and continue working, continue learning. And that's how I become today what, what I am. So because of what he educated. Another thing is, is a very amazing part too is uh, one day I saw 
two of my classmates, the same movements, white crime movements, and two of them, they come out of different applications. And to me, it's one movement and one application because my mind is stubborn. Then the, that's why I come to ask him, he say, which one is right? Then he look at me, he say, hey, how much is one plus one? I say, two. He said, no, it's not two. I thought it's a killing because uh, one plus one, everybody know. But he said, no, it's not two. I said, how come it's not two? One plus one is two. He said, your father is one, your mother is one, you have five children, now you have seven. He said, one plus one is seven. Then I stopped. He said, that's an art. If you treat art dead, one plus one is two. If you treat art alive, the art can be developed through the feeding. So one plus one can be many. See, that's why there are so many styles exist in China. It doesn't matter Xing Yi, Ba Hua, any style, they have so many different branches of style, but they come from the same principle. But once they still learn that, they learn to bring into their feeling and to their body's figure, body structure, body size, and they try to modify it and become their style. That's exactly in China. So it becomes so many styles. And the twin style, young style, what style, what style, whatever, is meant to be because it's an art. Art is created by feeling, and this feeling is alive. When feeling is alive, it's creative. If art is not creative, it's dead. Okay, after explaining it, I understand. That one also opened my mind very imagine, very much. The reason because I was so stubborn, I put myself in the corner. When I look at the corner, all I see is a corner. And that's a but now he teach me how to turn my body around 180 degrees. All I see is not corner. It's a huge room or a huge space. So since then, I start open my mind. And not only I learn from him, I learn from anywhere I can. And uh, I try to open my mind, keep my mind myself humble. And then that's how I learn. Continue learning, continue learning. As I end up, I have written more than 40 books and uh, probably so many videos. Because the more I write, the more I share the more I learn. And so writing is actually motivation of my learning. So that's a that's an amazing part to me because uh, to me, my success has come from this uh, philosophy. And another thing is a very funny thing is, uh, yeah, one day I come to see him, I was so depressed. Yeah, because one of my classmates, he's very good. And uh, he can remember things so fast and learn so fast. I, I was stupid, I, I learned very slow. Yeah, I learned very slow, so I was frustrated. So one day I just come to him. I say, well, yeah, look at that. I'm, I'm so stupid. I cannot learn fast and then compare with someone. I know I'm so dumb. Then he look at me. He say, hey, why are you look around? Because you want to plow, because he's a farmer. So you want to plow? And because you want to plow. It's not because people around you want to plow. Why you look around? If you think you are ahead, you're so proud of yourself, then you become lazy. When you are you are behind, you got depressed, you got so stressful. Then why you look around? You, because you want to learn art, you want to learn it, just keep your head down and keep plowing, keep plowing, keep plowing. Okay, keep digging, don't look around, don't compare. One day when you say, okay, I'm taking a break. Okay, when you talk, take a break, you look around, see where's everybody? Because uh, you dumped them so far behind, you cannot even see them. See, that's exactly what I do. Since then, I just keep my head down, keep plow, keep plow, keep plow, keep learning, keep writing, whatever I can. The more I learn, the more I share, the more I share, the more I learn. Amazing. That's my life. So that's why I start understanding what he call uh, learning martial arts or even teaching martial arts is a way of the life, is the meaning of life. So amazing part. So, and um, this also, we say all these things, you know, to accomplish that, you have to go through the self conquering. Yeah, if you don't have self conquering, then that's why the people call self discipline. Because you always say, okay, you, you should be outside wrong, inside square. I say, what do you mean, outside wrong? You say, you want to get along with the people. This society is a big ball. Inside have a lot of small balls. If there's one square, either it be grind down to be a ball or he be kicked out of the circle. So he say you want to be get along with people, outside be wrong, so you don't have problems with other people. But inside you have to be square. 
because you don't have a square in your inside with you, then you don't have a discipline. Oh, oh. Yeah, that's also this is another lesson because I can tell you all this lesson it influenced me because uh, because uh, that's what I understand. From since then, I try to set up a goal for myself and uh, I try to conquer myself. And then see, for example, I hate physics. I hate physics, but enough, I got my PhD in science. And people say, well, how can you hate physics and you got to all the way to master degree and PhD? I say, that's because I hate it so much. Because in order to conquer myself, I have to stay inside. If I can stay inside, how can I conquer myself? If I like it, then there's no conquering. Is it, the, all I do is I do what I like, and then there's no conquering, and then my spirit cannot be developed. See, that's why I conquer myself. Say, okay, the more I don't want it, the more I have to do it. Huh. So that, mm. that's how that that's how I am today. Yeah, I'm 74 now. I'm still a student. I'm continuing learning. <laughs> so. Did you say 40 books? You've written 40 yeah, books? More than 40s. More, more. Yeah, more than 40s. Why the first one? What The first one, the first one, because the first four books are actually published by a unique publication. Because that time I just come to the United States, okay, let me see. After I got, received my PhD in 1978, in 1978, from that time I already been in America for four years. At that time, Bruce Lee just passed away. And at that time, as though you're Chinese, they think you know martial arts. <laughs> That's our mentality at that time. <laughs> so, so in 1978, the martial arts is so popular. And not only that, the school challenge school, people challenge people, not like today. Today is very peaceful. Okay, so that time I said, well, and when I get a 19, a 1978, when I received my PhD, and I started working for an engineer for six years, and I, I had it. I didn't like it at all. I feel like uh, six years, I got no life. Because all I became is a money slave. Every day you drive in the traffic and go there, work so hard, go back, you're so tired, and then you're so sleep. Pretty soon, six years pass already. What I think about, what's my life? And I think about, I got no life. I'm only money slave. So after that, I decided to quit. See, because it's a good timing, because at that time in 19, 1983, the martial arts still very good. So when I was... Uh, when I started recognizing it in 1978, actually I started writing book because I tried to introduce myself to the public. So at that time, the unique publishing publications, they they took my first book and their book, they said, no, it's too big. Yeah. Because I uh, shot in long fist, you say too big. But it's a very big book because inside have all the long fist contents inside. So that's because the reason that's why we separate it and come uh, the Shaolin China. China actually amazing to me is that uh, Americans don't know Chinese China, but they know Japanese Tzu mm. Yeah, but the Tzu Jitsu actually from Chinese to China. <laughs> yeah, because the Jap- Japanese culture, you know, 50, 60% of Japanese culture came from China. That's why you look at Japanese, uh, the letters, uh, the symbols, Inside 50% Chinese symbols. So I can read Japanese. Japanese can read Chinese. But we cannot talk to each other. Like we can communicate each other by writing. Because Japanese, they learn everything from China. Like a judo. Judo come from Chinese wrestling. And karate come from Chinese white crane. And, uh, and the Tsuchitsu come from the, come from China. And nobody knows China, but people know Tsuchitsu uh, Akito. Oh, so I say, okay. If I want to introduce myself to the public, I have to tell them now what is China about. So that's why I say in my first book, China. So today you can see, if you go to France, you see they have a martial encyclopedia. The authority of China, you see my name's there. <laughs> it's a martial encyclopedia. That's because that's my first book of China. After that, people start realize, oh, Chinese China is the origin of Tsuchitsu Akito, all those locking techniques. But eventually, then in China, there's no China style. There's no China style. China is existing every style. Because in Chinese, every style emphasizes four things. Okay. T is kicking. Da is striking my hands. And Sui is a wrestling. Wrestling, Na is the China. So amazing part, kicking and striking when they pass through Japan become karate. 
And then when the wrestling go to Japan, become judo, and the china go to Japan, become jiu-jitsu, akido. So when this thing is actually four things has to be together. Yeah, because you can see wrestling is special against kicking and punching. The wrestling, in order to take people down, you have to really touch people's body. But before you touch me, I already kick you. I already punch you. Before you even reach me, your hand reach me. So big reason, in order to take people down, you have to wait until people attack you. So when that time will give you a chance, when they fail the attack, that's why you can get in right away, you can take them down. Okay, and then but for the wrestling, they have to touch the body. But China is not easy to against kicking and punching. China is not easy. But China is easy against people they touch you. So once you touch you, China is locking right away. So that's why China is against the wrestling and kicking and punching against uh, against China. So in China, every style, in order to, to make the style complete, you have to have a ti da, a suai ma, four things, kicking, punching, and the wrestling, and kicking, uh, and the China. So lots of four things. But today, you know, there's a, a lot of people don't understand that. That's why I try to educate people, because the people they got from Japanese mentality of karate. <laughs> I remember I was laughing when I, in 1974, when I came to the United States. The first thing, there's a song there called Kung Fu Fighting, Kung Fu Fighting. I was, <laughs> yeah. I was amazed and said, Kung Fu is not fighting. And they said, no, Kung Fu is fighting because from Bruce Lee, motion picture. I said, no, Kung Fu is not fighting. You can learn piano, you can learn painting, you can, you can go to your college, whatever. As long as you take a spend time and energy to accomplish anything in Chinese it's called Kung Fu. Kung Fu, that's mean time and energy. There's nothing to do with a uh, martial art. Martial art is a Kung Fu. Kung Fu is not necessary martial arts. Okay, that's the first thing I do. Um, that's American's mentality. Okay, the second thing I was so surprised. We look at Chinese uh, Kung Fu. It's classified in the yellow book. It's under karate. I said, what? It's a karate. It's from China. And uh, how come Chinese Kung Fu is, is under karate? That, that's why I started. Study say what? What's the reason? I realized after the Second World War, American Navy force and the Air Force they stay in Japan to help Japan to protect against Russia. So the American soldiers they learn karate and then bring it back to America in 1950s and the early 60s. Then not only they invite Japanese master come to America. So that's why karate is Oriental martial arts first introduced in this country. So that's why everything, everything Oriental martial art is karate, is karate. Even today, a lot of people still karate. Chinese martial art, oh, karate. So I don't understand that. So, but, but anyway, <laughs> that, that's a pass. Okay, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so now I hope, I don't know, after so many books and videotape, I, I publish it. Because I found it, YMAA publication, I found it. I found it and uh, about 16 years ago, I, I sold it to one of my employees. Actually, he was my student and he did a good job and continued to carry the mission. So the way I made publishing now has been recognized in the whole world. So, so my book is mostly published by them. And I write novels. I write six novels and then I try to, because I write this novel last few years and try to, to share people about the feeling of my life. Because uh, I cannot write or to be autographs. But people say, why not? He said, no, in my lifetime, I have a lot of positive things and negative things. And should I mention about both? If I only say the good part, not the bad part, then I'm lying. It's almost like you see the commercial, they always tell you the good of the, the products. They don't tell you the bad part. They don't tell you the side effect of the bad part. So I, I cannot do that. If I want to write autobiography, I have to expose what I had, what, who, who I had, who betrayed me, whatever. I cannot write that. So I said, okay, then how can I share my story? Then I write novels. So hey, I would encourage people go to Amazon.com, find the novels, read my novel in all my life. <laughs> Which do you enjoy writing more, novels or uh, the more instructional well, nonfiction? Because the question, the novel is for me is a more relaxing. Yeah, because I have create story and put my life story mixed together with the with the novels, and novel helped me to prevent my Alzheimer's. <laughs> oh, 
Because I have to keep my mind busy. If I don't keep my brain busy, I become all time Alzheimer. So, <laughs> so you you are you know the they say if you don't use it, you lose it. So I have to keep my mind <laughs> right. acting. So but, well, well, let let's talk about the the using it, the martial arts. We we heard about your instructors in China, but you've lived in in the U.S. for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, what what happened with your training when you got here? Because that's exactly what happened. Nineteen, because I learned from three masters in nineteen seventy four. I came here. I look around. I look around. At that time, you had to pay one dollar. One dollar is big money to me. Okay, you had to pay one dollar to even observe to watch the class in the martial arts school. Okay, it's not easy. So I pay one dollar for that to watch the class. And after I watch it, so many places, about six places, I say. That's not martial art. This is, it's, it's no essence. So that's, that's why I realized that all the martial quality is very low at that time because everybody, they learn a couple of moments, they open the school because everybody wants to learn martial art because Bruce Lee. Okay, so that's, a, that's another problem. So that's why when I was in Purdue, I started thinking about how can I share my what I learned with the American. So that's why I, I start share. But even in Taiwan now, I went back to Taiwan. Taiwan also, you know, because of modern style, modern lifestyle, then the martial arts is not really serious now. They treat it like a hobby. It's not like when we trained in 1960s. So we trained it it's very, very serious. It's very traditional. But nowadays, martial arts is not really as serious as it used to be. And people train for fun. It's not like in that situation. Yeah, it's not only that, because since martial art become a business, for example, I learned from three masters, I didn't pay one penny, because uh, they just want to teach you, and that's it, and uh, you stay with them. And that time, all the students, we accept it, we commit ourselves, we train hard. But today is no, today is all money business. Between teacher and students, it's money. There's no moral, there's no, there's no compassion, there's no relations. He said, masters, masters. So I pay you money. You are my employee. That's all. So those kind of attitudes. So that's why there's no respect. There's no martial morality today. When I see that, I feel very sad because, uh, because Chinese martial are usually Chinese martial art. Every martial art, you can see most of good Chinese martial art, high level martial art from monastery. Okay. I don't care. Tai Chi Chen is from Taoist monastery. Okay. Sarin Chen come from Buddhist monastery from Shaolin. Okay, and uh, there are a lot of martial arts all from monastery. But monastery, they are monk. The monk, they are supposed to teach people how to kill people. But they're the useful defense of that because people they don't understand. The trained martial arts inside have a two aspects of training. One is the inside, and the other is the young side. Young side is physical manifestation. Inside is your mind. Because your mind initiates anything, then it actually is outside. So the question is two parts. So the deeper the mind is, the stronger, the more powerful external can be manifested. Okay? But today, outside is a manifest, it's a forms. But inside is called meditation, is a mind, focus, alertness, awareness, and the spiritual cultivation, self-conquering, what we call self-discipline. All this is internal. Today, I feel very sad because you can see all the martial art movies today. They don't emphasize the, the, the good side. They don't emphasize the inside. All they emphasize is killing, violence. I feel sad because uh, I remember before I was uh, impressed for the movie. Uh, it's a movie series in, the, in TV called Kung Fu. Yeah. Kung Fu by Dave Cowrings. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one, every, every show inside still talk about morality, talk about the life, talk about everything. So they show I love it. Because I didn't like the fighting. The fighting was bad. But question, the philosophy, I like it. Because this really matched the Chinese philosophy. But that philosophy, 1980, 1990, now until now, it's all gone. You can see, they don't see more martial movies. Martial movies become fantasies, become like a Superman, like a Walt Disneyland. And uh, you can see that like, even Crouching Tiger and Hidden Dragon, this all, all those... Uh, the, the, the Jackie Chan, uh, not Jackie Chan, Jack Lee's movie, it's all get a wire hanging there, fly around. I say, I feel sad. So I, I remember when I was in Egypt about 20 years ago, 
when I was in Egypt for the seminars, I was invited to have a lecture in the, in the college, in the universities. Inside, amazing, 120 students come to listen. And the, you know what the first thing they ask? They ask, can I teach them how to fly like a crouching tiger and hidden dragon? <laughs> oh, and I look at that, I said, that's college students. Then I ask them one question, okay, you tell me, okay, how many times Chinese win Olympics? If Chinese can do that, Chinese wipe out all Olympics already. <laughs> <laughs> they don't wake up. That's a great point. Yeah. And then another student asked me, say, oh, I heard Chinese master would be able to project their mind and send the chi to kill people miles away. <laughs> I look at him and say, well, look at that. George Bush is still alive, right? But if Chinese can do that, they already kill all American prisoners or whatever. <laughs> it's, it's not. It's not. There's a, there's a, there's a Buddhist. That's a those kind of thing. It's not realities. But those. Why do you? Uh, why do you think people are obsessed with these yeah, fantasy it's, it's, ideas? And specifically, <laughs> as as you're saying, we tend to think of these dramatic, larger than life <laughs> ideals being part of Chinese martial arts. I've never heard anybody talk about, uh, you know, Taekwondo practitioners doing any of these things or or old Okinawan masters doing these. No, you know, because they are more real, but you know, Chinese become fantasies. And these are fantasy because the people like it. Let's just start from mainland China when they emphasize the modern wusu. Modern wusu, they started from 1970s, okay? And then from there, they all the emphasize is the forms. There's no meaning of the movements. All this is performance and be, make it beautiful, make it acrobatic. And uh, because the reason, you ask them, because I sponsor uh, Chen Pei. Chen Pei is while I'm the master, me and Bo Xin Ma. Bo Xin Ma is uh, Dan Yan's mother. Three of us, we sponsor Beijing wusu team because in 1980s. Because 1980s, Usu still can get big. And we sponsor Beijing Usu team. Beijing Usu team is supposed to be the best in the whole country. And then we invite them to come to America for six cities to perform. In Boston, I talked to them. And uh, Jack Lee's master, Wu Bin, was there too. So on the bus, I asked them. That, for example, I took them to Harvard University. When I took them to Harvard University, they perform beautiful. Yeah, because those training is not easy. It's also our combat is not easy. Very practice, trip around. It's not easy, but it's beautiful. So, but I try to see, okay, they have such a good reflexes and the those thing. How much of them can really use it for fighting? So, when I was in Harvard University, I chose the biggest member in the team. I go there, my right hand lock his left hand. When I lock it, he doesn't have reflexes. He doesn't know how to get out. Oh, he said, just don't hurt me, don't hurt me. I'm performing tonight. That I, I saw real feel sad because they've been training since they were five, six years old until now, 20 years old. Then they cannot defend themselves. And they call martial arts. It's called, it's called dancing. It's a performance. So that's why on the bus, I asked, we've been, I asked the Japanese master. He said, what happened? Because China, why they emphasize so much of modern wusu? He said, oh, because people like a, like become a movie star. Yeah, you want the movie star, all they see is the looking. So they end up today's martial arts movies, it's all emphasized looking, fancy, fancy things, and those kind of superpower things. And the, that's why you, one of the questions you, you know, list is say, do I, what movie I like? I, I like old movies. Like an old movie, like a uh, Jack Lee's uh, first movie, The Shouting Temple, The Shouting Kids. Lots of times they don't have those kind of fantasy things. That's because it's more real. But now you feel like uh, you, you don't have that feeling. You feel like everything like a Superman. Yeah, it's almost like you know, you know, you know uh, Star Wars, right? Star Wars. They start from Episode Four, Five, Six. Those three, I like it. Then when you come to one, two, three, all the computer graphic stuff and everything, it just feel like it's not real. It, it just feel like I'm the kids and they treat me like the kids, especially now what Disney, they bought it. They, when they bought it, they're even worse. There's, the reason of the show, when I look at the first time, I say, what is that? So that's, that's a question. The people's mind is shallow today. All they look and they, they don't think deep. For example, now I always feel sad. You know, classical music, classical music help you focus. 
and develop your feeling, deeply touch you. But today, the kids, they don't want to listen to classical music. You, you cannot find classical music station easily in the radio. And all they want is all these things that numb yourself and they're very shallow. And I say, what is the feeling of it? Because today they emphasize looking, emphasize material things, the spiritual things, internal things, the feeling thing. They downgrade it. So that's what makes me feel so sad. So hopefully, I don't know. If I keep writing books, hopefully I can brainwash some of the people to join me. <laughs> Well, I'm I'm wondering, you know, as as we talk about martial arts and how it's changed in some of the places where you think it's, I guess, failing. Yes. Yeah, how can those of us who <laughs> love martial arts and train, how can we help? How can we make it? Better? Yeah, because the first one, you know, the movie, because the movie affects everybody. For example, 1960s, all the movies, all the movie stars have cigarettes in the movie, 1960s. And after that, all the school kids, everybody tried to learn because it's cool, it's a fashion. So martial arts influence society so much, people don't understand it. So the martial arts, the movies that come out has to be really right, righteous, and to help people, to direct people in the right way, in the wrong way. And I emphasize now is the violence and all these things. And, the, and that's what makes me feel sad. So in the first things they want to see uh, the public, for example, now we talk about Chinese martial arts. Because Chinese martial arts in Taiwan, in China, is in a college course. It's a college course because inside talk about spiritual side, talk about internal feeling, and talk about the performance. But it's not in this country. Everything is emphasized violence. When they emphasize violence now, people start hating because it cannot be classified like a golf, like a basketball. Like it cannot classify them because it's a violence. That's because they emphasize so much of violence of the Chinese martial art or in the movies. And the, and the people like it. You know, that's what makes me feel sad. You know, the humans, we have a genetic memory. Okay, genetic memory is in your limbic system. That's a genetic memory developed through the thousand years of a history, human history, by repeating history. But you look at that, it makes yourself nervous because uh, all the animals have a genetic memory. For example, the cows, after the, they, they, they were born, they already know how to suck in milk, they already know how to find the water. All those things is genetic memory. The genetic memory comes from repetition in the history. Okay? So, when I look at that, then we have genetic memory. When I look at human history, it makes me scared. Because in human history, you see, it's all the conquering, killing, Raping, slavery, all these bad things, violence. And uh, you look at this violence even until 1950s, that's during the Second World War. How can I went to the camp in Poland? Hitler killed six million Jews in four years. How can humans so violence? And this is in our blood. But also we have a good side in our genetic memory. It's compassion and uh, the kindness, all those things. But Question today, the movie, the general public, they don't emphasize the good part of the human. They all continue focusing on violence, those things, because they sell. Those things, they sell. People like to see movies, violence. And then they sell. That's because in their blood, in our blood. But we continue to encourage people to be violent. How can human come to the peace? Because we don't, we, we suppress, downgrade the good part of our genetic memory. That makes me feel sad. So in this case, if human continue like that, our spirit cannot grow. If our spirit cannot grow, I don't think we can go to other planets. One day when human will be able to jump into the hyperspace and go to other planet, the alien will have to have a war with us. I tell you the truth. Because the question that alien, they are able to come to the earth if they have been seen. If they come to the earth already, so that means their spiritual is very high and they don't try to conquer you. But human, we go everywhere, we abuse, we conquer our spiritual law. That's because we still have that genetic memory. That's why you see the movie Avatars. That's really a good lesson when that's a human. So when, when human will be able to go to other planets, because so far we can. Yeah, we are able to do it. 
then they have to stop you from going there. Otherwise, you know, they cannot be safe. So because humans compare with the whole, the whole thing is humans are ugly, humans are violence, and humans selfish, humans viruses, like a, like a metric say. <laughs> but anyway, so because reason, you know, you want to change it, we have to see all the public include your station. You have to emphasize focusing the martial arts morality side of training. From martial arts, morality, how you can conquer yourself. How can you train? You be patient and endurable and calm down and think. Meditation is a key. You see, so traditionally, all Chinese martial artists, everyone meditate. That's why I started meditating when I was 15 years old. But today, they don't meditate. All they do is show off. All they do is, okay, I go to competition. Okay, I win. I win. I'm just glorified. And they, that that's make me sad. Maybe I'm old fashioned. I'm 74. Maybe I'm old fashioned. I try to compare with today, with the old times. But I, I found so far we got the wrong way. So that's the reason now public slowly, not slowly, very fast. Yeah, they slowly, they push all this violence away. They don't want this violence. Pretty soon you find out, you know, yeah, this will continue to grow. The martial is going to be dead because uh, we continue to emphasize. We don't emphasize a good part of discipline. All we emphasize is a, is a violence and killing. Okay, I'm sorry, <laughs> Jeremy. <laughs> no, no apologies. This is this is exactly what we go for on the show. I told you, I don't I don't talk much. I I prefer to hang back and let the guests tell the stories. And you're telling wonderful stories, but I think we're really on something that is it is important. And you know, you said maybe maybe it's because you're you're older, but I I think that. We, especially in Western culture, we don't value the opinions yeah. of our mm -hmm. elders. I think martial arts is a place where we do. But I think what you're saying here, I think it, I, I don't expect everyone listening to agree, and that's okay, but I want them to hear what you're saying because I think you have a really good point that martial arts has become such fantasy yeah. Yeah. that it becomes really hard for not just the general public, but those of us who train to separate the reality from the fantasy. And if you can't separate that, even while you're training it, how do you know how to train and why to train? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, they give you something so you can compare. When you compare, you get depressed. That's all. That's what they give to you. Mm. So because you see the old Superman, you say, okay, I want to become Superman. After you try so hard, I say, no, I cannot become Superman. Okay, I quit. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> okay what else <laughs> i'm i'm digesting i'm trying to pick one of the 400 questions i think i could ask you right now <laughs> and and i think i want to go back you talked about when you first came here that you visited schools yes and you observed <laughs> schools and i think you said you watched yeah. six of them and, and none of them had what you no. felt was was worth your time no. did you did you eventually find something or did you open your no, own school no, I can't. no because uh because uh, I, I find this, the quality is not good, you know, then they, they know a little bit, they start teaching, and every school have 200 students. Oh, gosh, I say, wow, they make good money. And then I say, no, my, my goal is to get my PhD. So I went to Purdue because at that time, one of my classmates teaching in Los Angeles and, uh, <laughs> and the San Francisco, <laughs> in, the, uh, in the San Francisco area. He, he told me, say, why are you going to put you for your quality or for what you train? I guarantee because he learned from me when I was in Taiwan, so he knows me. So he said, I guarantee you got 200 students in six months. I said, no, no, no. My goal is coming to the United States to get my PhD. That's my goal. I set up my goal, I go. So that's why I went to Purdue. When I went to Purdue, then, then I start because, uh, you, you know, at that time, Purdue, I got a scholarship. The scholarship is a tutor, it's a instructor scholarship that I have to teach. And each month I got $320. And uh, in, that's $310. My wife come next year, $320. We spend $17 a week for the food because the rent to the school is $120. And I had to send $50 home to help my mom because we have uh, so many kids. I'm the second one. My oldest brother is a military doctor, so doesn't have the money. 
So if second one is me, the next one is all in the school. So I have to send fifty dollars some to help my family. My mom say fifty dollars you send back. We can support the kids, support all the people for one month of living. That's how strong American money was at that time. Mm. Okay, so now I spend one dollar to watch everyone. That to me, that's ouch, because one dollar is a lot of money to me. So, but mm. when I was in Purdue, I started second year under Jeff Ball. Jeff Ball is my first student in America. Yeah, because uh, he he liked it, so he he helped me to form the Purdue Kung Fu Club. So that's how we started. At that time, each month I can get extra money. I can get almost two hundred dollars because each students only pay about fifteen or twenty dollars because the, the job he's more handling that. So, so, so to me, it's uh, even two hundred dollars. That's a big money for me. So that's why I started teaching. After I teach in Purdue for one year, then Purdue University, the theater department, they invite me to teach Tai Chi Chen for the students. It was a credit. I was surprised. I was impressed. I said, wow, why do you want to learn Tai Chi Chen in the theater department for the students? He said, no, because they know when you practice Tai Chi Chen, they pro- their performance will be more nature and more calm. And uh, that's what they wanted for to help their stage performance. Okay, that's why I, I start teaching that and also earn some money. So from there, that's how I start teaching. When I start teaching, I start organize what kind of book I want to write. So eventually when I come to the United States, I realized one thing, important things, I cannot find master here in America. If I want to find master, maybe in China, in Taiwan, I can find it, but not in America, definitely. So since then I say, okay, what can I do? The first one, I had to learn how to teach myself. And then in order to teach myself, I start collecting information. For example, I start teaching with you for Tai Chi Chuan. I didn't know too much about Tai Chi. I, I learned two and a half years with Master Gao in Taiwan. That's all I had. So when I put you, and I start collecting, trying to find any documents. In 1970, 1979, when I went back to Taiwan, I go to a library, I go to a bookstore because there's no internet at the time. So I just find any information I can. I bring back to the United States. I start studying them and self-learning. From there, I try to interpret because all this ancient writing interpreted. So through the collection and the comparing and after that I tried comprehending is understanding. After that and I start to write it so the way people can understand, go through this process. After I finish one book, I know the topic is very good. So because the reason when I write the first book, I start found I I, I learn. See all these motivations come from 1979. Okay, because uh, 1978 and uh, 1974, I come to the United States. And uh, 1978, my mother come because my first child was born. And uh, my mother told me, say, you know, your white grandmaster master passed away two years ago. I was completely shocked because he's like my father. I look at my mom, I say, why you didn't tell me? My mom looked at me and say, what would you do if I told you? I couldn't answer because uh, she knows if I know my master passed away, I will quit school, I'll go home. My mother looked at me and said, that's why I cannot tell you. To me, your school is more important than your master's funeral. See, that's the things. So because of the reason that in 1979, I started working as a uh, postdoctor, you know, research associate. So at that time, I got a vacation. I went back to Taiwan after five years in the United States. When I went back and uh, my master's two sons took me to his tombs, I sit in his tombs. I was so sad because I couldn't see him. And, and I look at the tombs. I sit there in the hot summertime. I sit there almost uh, two hours. The, his two sons was there with me. And uh, when I look at the tomb, I keep thinking, what is, what is the loss? None of my classmates, includes me, learned half of what he knows. He was with his master for 23 years. And the, none of us have that kind of commitments and, uh, and they reach the capability. So because reason, half of things lost, buried with him in the tombs. It's lost. That art preserved in China, but it's lost. So finally, instead of from too much, swear to him, 
That's my vow to you. When I come back to America, I never did ask and learn time. Anything I know, I reveal to the outside. There's no secret. I just share with people. If you don't share with people, the odds is going to be dead. So that's my story. I keep my promise. Since I come back in 1979, I start writing heavily. And that's why the book from Purdue and from Unique Publications start coming out. After four books, Unique Publishing, then I realized because you had to follow exactly what they want you to. But the way I write is not the way they want. They want more like a surface stuff. But I want to know is the theory behind what is the root behind for training instead of just only performance, only the forms. It doesn't have a meaning. So because reason after four years, after four books they published, I decided to start in my own publishing. At that time it's not easy because there's no computer, there's no software, you can write whatever. I had to go to Purdue University, I go to Harvard University to learn typesetting. And then I should photograph. And that time we had to shoot picture and every 16 pages become one sheet. After that, then you had to paste it, you had to get a picture, paste it, whatever. That's how I started the uh, publishing business. And then the beginning, I don't know, even know if I can survive. In 1982, I start, I quit my job because after six years in the engineer, I was so sick of it. I know if I continue to stay there, I'm going to kill myself. So. Finally, I quit. When I quit, I started writing the book, and then I started teaching. And the first two years, very tough. First two years, because my name is not that big yet. Or even though I have a full book published, but it's still not big. So the first four years, very hard. For example, the first year, because I, we, I, I didn't have a job, so I didn't have insurance. But at the same time, you know, I got a, I got a cold. When I got a cold, it turned to pneumonia. And the temperature going up, coming down, going up, coming down, and hanging there for about two, three months. Until one of my students, he was studying his PhD, uh, he's a doctor to, uh, to become a medical doctor. And he came, came back from Connecticut. He came to visit me. He said, hey, doctor, you look awful. I said, yeah, I don't know why my temperature up and down, up and down for two, three months already. He said, wait, wait. So he went back to bring those, uh, put in the ear to listen to your heart. I don't know what they call it. That's English. It's my Chinglish not that good. So, so he listened. He said, gosh, you have pneumonia. I said, what? He said, you have pneumonia. I said, two, three months. You should be dead by now. <sighs> so that's why I, I, I contact my brother because my youngest brother, he's a doctor. So that's why I contact him right away because I couldn't get the prescription. So my, my brother sent me, sent me the antibiotic right away. After I received antibiotic, I take it and amazing, uh, three days, four days later, the temperature start become going down and become stable. And then you see six months later, my first book come out. It's a Qigong for Health and Martial Arts. And those, I'm alone. I was a writer. I was an editor. No, I, I hire people to edit my Chinglish. Okay, and I was a writer, I was a typesetter, I was uh, everything. I was a garbage collector, I was a teacher, I was doing everything. I'm a superman. I was superman. And then, <laughs> yes, the book published. I tried to contact with the old, uh, all the martial arts stores, and uh, because they have four my books from publishing, uh, from unique publications. So some of them start carrying. I say, oh, start, people start buying my book. And uh, I published myself. Okay, so after that for a while, then one of my students called David Rebianzi, he came in and said, come in, let me help you to open the market. That's why he now he's the owner of a new YMA publishing now. Because he starts to in, he quit his school, he quit his job and come to help me. So I said, I cannot, help, I cannot pay you. He said, no, no problem. He said, I pay you by percentage. Every book you sell, you got 20%. That's how we started. And we started very difficult on the uh, nothing, no finance, no money, nothing. So we started step by step, one book after next week, and we learn. We learn from the past. We know what book is good, what book is not good, what book can sell, what book is not sell. So beginner is writing to survive. So that's why the beginning of my writing, you can see a lot of books for surviving. And uh, about one third is for myself learning. Yeah. But once the company becomes stable after 10 years, then I start writing a book. That one I can learn. For example, 
the deeper aspect of Tai Chi Chuan, the Qigong aspect of Tai Chi Chuan, because Qigong is part of Chinese martial art training. So that's why I want to know deeper and deeper. Let's end up now, my Qigong, so many books I published in Qigong, because since then I practice and I study the ancient documents, I understand them, and I try to write them and try to share with public. Through this process, I, I learned to teach myself. So since 1974, I came to the United States, I learned from myself. Of course, not from myself, from ancient documents. Because the ancient documents give me the guideline. Because that's one have been passed down for a thousand years. So those, uh, those documents to me is so important. So that's why when you do in my, when you see my book, you read my book inside a lot of ancient quote, ancient documents quotations inside. That's why. Let's let's shift gears a little bit as we start to wind down here. Okay, you you're still going. I, I know I know many people, and we've talked to a number of people on this show your age, and the the people we talk to on this show that are your age are like you. They're 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 still going. They're still working very hard and achieving and sharing their information. Yeah, you know why? But if we look at the rest of the world. Someone who's 74, they're often, they, they're just done. Uh, no. They sit. <laughs> no. Yeah, because, uh, because... What motivates you? Okay, okay. Why? Yeah, let's, let's go back to when I was 50 years old. When I was 50 years old, okay, at that time, I started thinking about the past. I don't think about the future. Because my father passed away when he was 48. Okay, that's why I was 50 years old. I said, mm, I already two years old with my father, so I'm ready. To go, so by that time I think about the past. So that's why it's everything I think about is not think about future. Okay, one of my best friends from Venice. Every time I went to Europe, he come to meet me because he can speak German, he speak French, he speak English, he speak all the European languages because he work in a casino. In the casino, he had to speak all kind of language. Then he interested in martial arts in Tai Chi Chuan and the uh, Qigong. So he always come to meet me in the first stop and he drive me around. So we become very good friends. So when I was 50 years old, he died. He's the same age as me. He was died. He died because, uh, doing meditation. So that's the reason we don't, people don't know meditation right. They don't know. Don't take a risk. Yeah. He talked about, he asked me about the turtle shell, uh, turtle breathing. I told him, I don't know what's the breathing. I heard of it, but I don't know the detail. I cannot teach you. He wants to learn that, but no. He meditated in the Venice, in the ocean, in the ocean. The head is above the water. And the sun, he, he, he cannot breathe. He asked his friend, pull him out. When the ambulance arrived, he already dead. When the doctor dies with his body, his lung is just like a scuba diver. He go to, from the ocean, deep ocean, come to the surface very quick. So there's a blood, you know, saturated into the vessels. Then he died for the cause. And the, the doctor said the only reason he was holding the breath when he meditate in the water. So that's why I know right away he's learning turtle shell breathing. So for a year, I went to Venice. I, I went to his tomb to show my respect. And uh, his friend, Franco, was there. I asked Franco, say, where he learned this uh, turtle shop with him, he said, I am from a Japanese master in the, in Venice. I said, can you take me to the Japanese master? I need to talk to him. He said, that master disappeared six months ago. So since then, I, I lost contact. So, so after his death, I still realized why I keep thinking of past. I'm waiting to die. So since then, I said, no, no, no. Like that, definitely I would die. So that's why I started praying ahead. I said, okay, now. I, I survived 50. Now I sure I try to go aim for 60. So from 60, I plan 10 years what I want to do for the next 10 years. So for the 60, oh, I'm still alive. I plan the next 10 years until 70. Now when I was 70, I said, oh, I'm still alive. So now I'm praying until 80. We'll see for another, because another six years and see what come out. Because in these six years, I'm going to finish another book with Tai Chi Chen and Health, and another book, the the scientific foundation of uh, ancient Chinese secret of youth. 
Yeah, because that one, because the now amazing today, you can get a lot of information verified by modern science, and I can come up with very good theory how and why ancient Taoists they will be able to live hundred and hundred and twenty years old. But at the same time, in ancient time, the average age only about forty, early forties. You see, the beginning of the last century, the average age for humans is only forty-seven. If you think about. It. Think about a thousand years ago. How can people live hundred? That's immortals. So that's the reason I, I start to understand why they can live so old. Because from today's science, I can verify it. Amazing. So that's why I start sharing with the people. All these are uh, my new understanding. I start sharing with people. Hopefully, it will benefit the future race for the humans. Makes sense. Wow, this has been... <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Such wonderful stories. And I bet we could go for hours longer. We'll have to have you back. Uh, I don't know. I'd be dead by then. (laughs) Well, I always ask the guest uh, to choose how we end. So what, what last words, what final thoughts would you give to the listeners today? What do you want them to take away from our conversation? Don't looking for glory of us. You like the arts because you like the arts. You like the art, keep your head bowing down. Keep practicing, keep practicing. Conquer yourself. Be patient and uh, learn. Yeah, from there, you slowly, you understand. That's one of the things, you know, I like the people to understand. The second thing, when they try to learn martial arts, try to learn the meaning of life. Instead of just, okay, just the martial arts for glory, for fighting, you know, like a cage of fighting the world, you know, MM, what MMA, whatever. Yeah, so those things, you know, those things is for glory. But your life is so short. What are you looking for that kind of glory? You see, when I try martial arts, it's not only, I'm, I feel fulfilling for my life. I feel spiritually, physically, I'm happy. Yeah, even now I'm happy, see, because uh, since I quit my engineering job, I enjoy my life so much. But it's because uh, I don't care what other people, I care it's me. How can I develop? Yeah, how can I keep my body healthy? Yeah, because my father died 48. Yeah, but I'm already 74. See, okay, I already winning. So average age, human average age now, the male is 81. So. If I get over 81, I win. <laughs> so people, they should know one thing, take care of themselves. It's not only physically, spiritually. And, uh, because today is one thing, i tell you one thing. People today in the heaven, they live in the heaven, but they don't realize in the heaven. But when you go through 1960s, like my, my life, today, everything you appreciate, Every bite, every piece of food you put in the mouth, you feel so appreciated. It's not like uh, today I see a lot of kids today, I don't like it so away, I don't like it so away. Because today they are in the heaven, they don't know they are in heaven, because there's no comparison. So they think what they are here is the hell, because they, they don't think, that to me, there's a heaven. So the, because the reason they should understand, try to understand the past, try to understand how much they have, they always should be appreciate what they have is not say what they don't have. The most important what they have, that's what makes you happy instead of what you don't have. Don't compare, just think about your life. Think about how you make your spiritual go higher. Yeah, so because uh, emphasize more spiritual life and physical life evenly, both sides have to balance. Instead of just physical side, you see today a lot of kids, they have everything. They have a car, they have whatever, they have whatever, all material things. You ask them, are you happy? No, they are not happy. They call me suicide. So that's why I don't understand. To my generation, oh, Lord's of heaven. Okay, so I will see. I don't know if your audience understand that today. But I think the older generation, 70 years old, they should know what I said. What a powerful conversation. What a generous storyteller. Man, it's a great stories. I had a really good time talking with Dr. Yang, and I hope you'll check out his work. Check out all the things. I mean, it's, he is not a hard person to find on the internet. Let's put it that way. And if you're maybe new to his books, pick some up. Check out his novels. Check out all this great stuff that this man has contributed to us, to the martial artists of the world. And to you, sir, thank you for your time. I really appreciate you coming on and 
sharing these great stories. I was, I think transfixed is probably the best word. Took me a minute to think of that one. If you want to see more, we've got links and photos and all that at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Every episode gets its own page. Sometimes people post some comments. We definitely link to other relevant episodes. We put up transcripts once we finish them. There's a whole bunch going on there. And if you want to support that work, remember you can visit the store at whistlekick.com and use the code PODCAST15 to save 15%. You might also consider buying one of our Amazon books or telling others about the show or supporting us at patreon.com slash whistlekick. And if you see somebody out there in the world wearing something with a whistle kick on it, say hello. Talk to them. Find out how they know whistle kick. Maybe you can share some stories. Maybe, maybe you'll make a new friend, new training partner. Heck, we, we, all, we all need to stick together as martial artists. So there's a lot that we can do. And, you know, I think there's a lot that we talked about, or at least I heard about, we all heard about on today's episode. Things that we can do to help make things a little bit better. If you want to reach out, my email is jeremy at whistlekick.com. And so that's all. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.